And I'm here to welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let's give Jesus another hand. We believe that God is moving around the world. And that doesn't exclude us here this morning. He's moving in the north. He's moving in the south, in the east, in the west, all around the world. God's presence is here. So let's grab hands as we hold hands together in unity in prayer. Because we're believing for a miracle this morning. We want to see souls saved. We want to see hearts lifted up. We want to see the word of God spoken as truth and in righteousness. We want to see a holy praise and holy worship ascend from this place into the heart of God. And as I pray, would you join me now? Father God, we just thank you in Jesus' name that we come into your presence happy and rejoicing and excited about what you did, Jesus, your death and your resurrection. About what you did, Jesus, the presence of your Holy Spirit that's working in the church worldwide. And so Holy Spirit reigns supreme. Lift every heart, lift every burden. Save souls locally and around the world. Heal minds, bodies, and hearts. Those that can't be here, heal minds, hearts, and bodies. And move under the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that we will never be the same. So we will let your gospel be known locally and around the world. So that we will be light changers. So that we will be salt. So that we will be wounded healers. So that we will walk in the path that you predestined us to walk in. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We all said, Amen. Go grab somebody. Give them a hand. Second Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, And our scripture reading is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with verse 6. Would you please stand to your feet for the reading of God's word? 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience, everybody say obedience, that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. The word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord. May it be blessing to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe may be seated. I just want to acknowledge our brother Toby Johnson in the service this morning. Good morning, Toby. Toby played the bass guitar for us this morning. He's a, a friend for, of many years, and he's also a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're just so blessed to have him here this morning. And there are many others of you that are here, and you're seeking God. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules to make your attendance at worship a priority. When you take the time to come to church, I believe that you are blessed. I declare uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the word that God gave me that every time that the people of God assemble in the house of God, there's a special blessing that comes on us. That we're healed, that we're strengthened, that we move from one step, that we move from glory to glory, that we're moving into the things of God. And this subject of giving is an important subject. We started it last week by looking at chapter 8 uh, of 2 Corinthians, and here in chapter 8, we talked about a situation, it's talked about in that chapter, where the church at Corinth was admonished by the Apostle Paul to be a blessing to some other Christians who were having a hard time. The church in Jerusalem, the poor people there were having a real hard time, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, thought it would be good that the Gentile churches would help out the 
church in Jerusalem, and so he asked the church at Corinth to give. And he used the churches that were of the Macedonian persuasion as an example of churches that did right. Because these churches weren't rich churches, and these were churches from the area of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And these churches were not rich churches. Now the church at Corinth, on the other hand, was a rich church in terms of their wealth and their means. It was also a church that at times had worldliness in it. It was also a church that was located in an area where there was multiple uh, uh, worship of multiple gods and deities. And so the Apostle Paul was warning the Corinthian church and, and admonishing them and encouraging them to stay on the right path that they needed to go. But Paul realized that a sign of true maturity, and he says it over and over in these two chapters, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, that if you and I want to be Christians and if the church here want to be Christians that please God and mature in their faith, that we have to understand what the principle of giving is about. And when we give, we should give as unto God, number one, and we should give cheerfully. If we go back to chapter 8, look at a key verse in chapter 8 and verse 5. It says, And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. I would submit to you that a true Christian, a Christian that's seeking God, a believer that really wants to be on the right track, a believer that got to the place where you're saying in your soul, in your heart, in your mind that you want to follow God and you want to do the things of God, and you made it up in your mind that you are tired of the enemy having havoc in your life, ruling in your life, and you want to move into a step that's closer to God. No, you're not saying that you're perfect. You're not saying that you're a super Christian that can do no wrong. You don't want to get legalistic about it, but you just decided that you made and you want to get closer to the Lord and say to Jesus Christ, you want to be like Christ. You know that old uh, habit where Michael Jordan used to be a player back in years? They had commercials. You used to say, I want to be like Mike. And all the little kids, boys and girls, wanted to play basketball and be like Michael Jordan. Well, I want to submit to you, we want to be like our hero, which is Jesus Christ. We want to be like Christ. Say amen to that. That's something that you can attest to because you don't serve a Christ who just charges you $150 for expensive sneaker and never Yeah. Uh -huh. 
God bless me immensely. Did you know that? I don't know if I told you. Two thousand. How much did you have for Fox? She had a hunch for it. That ain't fair. So, mine was a state college, and Darius was a, uh, I mean, state college, Darius was a private, so I thought that was one, right? So we both were friends. The state colleges are a lot cheaper than private colleges. And many of our counterparts, thousands of dollars. But Deborah operated off the same ethic that I did. And that ethic is, have Jesus be your first love, yeah. and you'll be blessed. Right. Now let's look at an Old Testament first love experience. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. Anybody need a Bible? Young people to the rescue. Anybody need a Bible? Raise a hand. These young people get your Bible. <laughs> Anybody else? Genesis chapter 14 and verse 17. Here's where it all started. This whole thing about giving. After Abram returned from defeating the Kedorlamor the and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaddah, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, King of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of the Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Bless me, Abram, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And bless me, God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abram gave him a tenth. Hello there. So that means all the spoils that he got of war, Abraham decides to give this man a tenth. Why would he do that? Something welled up in Abraham's soul that this man who he didn't know, who he recognized a priest of the Most High God who had blessed him, he decided to bless the man of God because the man of God just blessed him. He, the inferior, gave deference to the superior and he decided that he was going to bless him and give him a portion of what he received. And the Bible here says that it was a tenth. Turn to Leviticus 27.30. Leviticus 27.30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil, or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now look at verse 34. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses on Mount Sinai for the Israelites. Well, Moses received the Ten Commandments and Moses gave the Ten Commandments to the people and in addition to the Ten Commandments were given a bunch of other commandments and a bunch of other laws and regulations and God to understand percentage giving. And so they had to give a tenth of everything that they earned to the Lord. Now this is Old Testament. And then turn to Malachi 3.10. Testament and the New. 
So you would say, well, Pastor, here in the Old Testament, you just given us three scriptures on tithing. So should we be given a tenth of our resources to God's kingdom? Well, the answer is yes, maybe no. And the reason why I say yes, maybe no is that you can give a ten percent, but notice that it was the Old Testament principle that Jesus himself expanded on. And I believe that as you understand what Jesus is and get back to that first love that was talked about in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians that they gave first to God because Jesus was their love, Jesus was their joy, it was Jesus that gives us healing, it's Jesus that saves our soul, it's Jesus Christ that liberates us when we're depressed, it's Jesus that changes our minds and we start thinking screwed up. And so we all owe him everything. We're on our way to heaven seeking God the Father someday in heaven because of Jesus Christ. So he is our first love. So all scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament, has relevance. So you might say, and here's an argument. Sometimes we do q and I want you to do Q&A in your mind with me. I don't want verbal answers, but I want you to think about it. So should we subscribe to the Old Testament principle of tithing? Or is there another New Testament principle about giving that we need to be about? Let's look at the all scripture passage. Tom, read it real loud for everybody. Loud. Thank you, Tom. So it says all scripture is useful, and it lists a bunch of a bunch of uh, reasons why it's useful, and it also said it's useful for teaching. So we can get some value out of the Old Testament principle of giving, and we can compare it with the New Testament admonition in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. Remember this: that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now last week we talked about excelling in the grace of giving. Because in chapter 8 it talked about to excel. Excel is to surpass. Excel is to do things, do things in an extraordinary fashion. And God wants us to know that our giving needs to be as a sign of our maturity in Jesus Christ. And that as we give, the other areas of our, the other areas of our lives that grow, which is our speech, our faith, our earnestness, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. That's those, those three or four things are mentioned. And then it also says giving. So giving is just one part of our lives that should be maturing in God. We should mature in our love for the scriptures. We should mature in our relationships with each other. And we should also mature in our giving. And we should even excel in it. Everybody say excel. Excel. So we shouldn't just give it on a happiness level, but we need to give on an extraordinary level. And we also need to grow in our Christian experience, and we need to grow in our Christian experience on an extraordinary level. Paul is saying we need to do all the above. Don't just pick out one of them. Some people say they are mature Christians, they love the Lord, and they do this, that, and the other, but they don't give to God. Some Christians give it to God, and they do it on a legalistic basis. Oh, I tie every Sunday. I give my check. But you don't love your neighbor. It's right there. Today. You don't love the guy who has his music in the apartment below your blast, and you want to go out and give him a piece of your mind. So you are not growing in every area of your life. And you need to do all the above. You need to grow in your giving, and you need to grow in your relationships and how you treat one another. Let the church say amen. amen. And so when I think about giving, what it says to me is, I give out of my love for Jesus Christ and what he has done for me. And here's how it started with Abram. Abram had went out to battle. He had to rescue his nephew Lot, who had gotten into trouble. And if you look at the Old Testament, there seems to be many scriptures where Abram is always rescuing Lot. And he goes after Lot because Lot had been taken captive. And so Abram goes to, re to release his nephew from the bondage of these neighboring kings who were evil and who were trying to take advantage of them. So Abram goes out to war with strong, with a significant number of his strong fighting men, and he was able to conquer them and subdue them. Abraham is thankful that God gave him the victory, and when he gets his blessing from this priest called Melchizedek, he decides that he is going to bless the man of God because he first got blessed. So all of us here together, if you haven't gotten blessed, all of us here in one voice as we think about the subject of giving, if God hasn't done anything for you, don't give. But if all of us here together somehow realize that there was a time in your life that you were down in the dumps, that you was in bondage and sin, that you were doing something that was destructive and that was going to cause the end of your life, and God picked you up from where you are and liberated you, then you ought to have a heart of love and gratitude and 
you are that you can't say anything. Amen. Some of you, the Lord is blessed with significant numbers of money, and you come to the house of God and to causes of God, and you give in liberty. And God says He delights in your giving because you give out of heart and gratitude. Some, unfortunately, hopefully, not many in this church are giving begrudgingly and are giving because they were told they need to tithe, and they give it and they brag and they say, "I give my tithe every Sunday." And those of you that are giving in that fashion, you're missing your blessing. But those of you this morning that want to excel in your love for God, as you consider this scripture here, Second Corinthians chapter nine, you will see that because God loved you and that He sent His Son to die on the cross. Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church that they were considering to help the church in Jerusalem that was poor, that they should give an offering. This wasn't even a tithe. This was an offering. Now, for those of you who might want to say, one other footnote on tithing, those of you that might want to say, well, tithing is just an Old Testament principle, and it's not a New Testament principle, let me give you a scripture. We turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. I'm really going to muddy up the waters now. Luke chapter 11 and verse 42. This is the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can't get no better than that. Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your men, room, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Okay, so let me just define a couple things. When you hear someone say former in language terms, that means the first thing that's mentioned. When you hear someone say latter in language terms, that means the second thing that's mentioned. So let's look at the verse again in that section. You should have practiced the latter. What was the latter? Justice and the love of God. Now the emphasis and the main point of this passage of scripture in this review that Jesus gives his, these Pharisees are uh, that they need to do justice. That Jesus was sick of the way they walked around with their phylacteries, that's their things on their heads and their foreheads and their fine robes and acting all pious and talking to the public square and praying these long prayers and acting like they were good people but their hearts, Jesus said, was like a, a wash basin that was filled with dirt and grime. And so Jesus did, could stand in hypocrisy. So he was giving them woes. He was giving them rebukes. And he was telling them that they really ought to live a true life of service to God. And that he cares more about justice and caring about caring for people who are poor and caring for people who are not tired than the fact that they could brag and say that they were tired. But what did Jesus say? He said, you should have what? You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So the emphasis is to do justice and to love mercy. But he also affirms the fact that tithing should also be done. Is tithing in the New Testament? There it is. But what is the emphasis, though, of most of the New Testament scriptures on giving? That's what I want to get at. So here's my conclusion. As we go back to, uh, as we go back to 2 Corinthians, Chapter 9. I'm going to get right to the chase real quick. And those of you who want to go deep into this, come an hour before church. Every Sunday morning, we get deeper into these scriptures and we break them down further. But notice what the scripture says. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And here's the verse. Each man, that word man made means man or woman, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Here's the top. See? Did you see the compulsion thing is everybody on the top? It was preached on with Moses. Can you hear the Pharisees talking? Can you hear some religious leaders talking in all our denominations, including this one sometimes? You're the top. Each man or woman, don't give under compulsion. Don't give because a rule has been set. Don't give because it, you think it's just a good thing to do the mama did and the granddaddy did. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So when you start being a 
cheerful giver. And when you start giving generously, chapter 8 and 9, both talking about being generous givers. When you move from beyond tithing to being a generous giver, when you set free from the bondage of giving in that way, and you're free to just on demand, open up your pocketbook, and give as unto God, oh my goodness, the Bible says later on in the verse, you read it. I read it initially when I stood up and read the whole scripture. It says that you're going to find out that in every situation of your life, young people, you're going to have resources that will come to your disposal when you need them because you are a generous giver. Now here's the statistic. In most churches, only a third, and that's being generous, of the people give in most churches. So if that's the statistic in most churches, what do you think it is in this church? I won't say no more. We want to get to the place where everybody can get in on the blessing. Did you know that giving was instituted not for God, but for you. Giving was instituted not for God, but for you. It was a vehicle for you and I to be blessed. And when you and I get set free and open up our wallets, our pocketbooks, to the availability of God, and say, at any time, Lord, you can have all. That takes a step of faith, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know if I told you a story. A friend of mine told me this story. But I first met him, I did tell you once before, but it just amazed me. This guy's a Wall Street broker. And a ton of money. He told me how much he was making. Ten million a year. Ten million. And he said he went to San to go see his Wall Street broker. He lives in San Francisco here. He goes to his house. So in his mind, he's thinking, because he invited me to come out to the town. So in his mind, he's thinking, oh man, I got up to this house. This is going to be a nice day. It's probably going to get a mansion. He starts driving, the dress is good, close and close to He knows that the neighborhood wasn't too good. <laughs> so he goes kind of running out. He gets closer to the dress, and he notices it's all apartments. It wasn't a house. So he finally looks, it's the right address, it's an apartment building. It's got a little run down the park, but it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't that secure. So he goes up, parks his car, goes up to his guy, and he, he kind of, and he kind of has this look on his face, and the guy goes, oh, I know what you're thinking. You want to happen and not live in a nice bed, because she didn't want she had it. And he said, I got to the place that I give away, get this, 90% of my salary to the kingdom of God. And he said, and giving away 90%, I found that I have plenty of money to put away for my college education. My wife and I live good. And then he went to in the guy's car and he took a ride. He didn't have a brand new car, he had a used car. He said, I've decided instead of giving that to the world, I've decided to go help people in our town that are poor. I give to my church, I give to ministries. I said, Lord, how would you, how would you like me to give away this money? And he goes, I get so excited doing it. And he goes, I didn't start out at 10 million either. My income was a lot, a lot less. And he says, but as time went on, went on, and as I gave to God, he just put more money in my hands. So the question that you and I have to answer is, how much money can God trust you with? Would you rather have a million dollars a year? Or only twenty thousand dollars a year, and keep most of the twenty, and give away most of what God had you if He had ten million. But it would be tempting if He had ten million not to give away. Now I have ten million, but if you want to spend that money, so here's the deal. Am I saying that you should be like this man? No. God has called you and I to do it the way we want to do it, because that scripture says each person should purpose in your heart. Yeah. So here's what I want you to do. You can bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. You've heard the word of the Lord. Some of you are giving faithfully. Some of you are blessed. Some of you are having troubles. Some of you need deliverance. So as Deborah's playing this song quietly, I want the Holy Spirit to speak a word to you. If you're not being a generous and a liberal giver, See, the other looks good.
You're not being a liberal giver. God wants you to demonstrate liberality, generosity, and a giving spirit. And then he will tell you what to give. He'll tell you what you said it used to be. Maybe you're not where you need to be. Maybe you need to step in faith and give ten dollars more than what you're doing. Maybe you need to go full board and say, Lord, I'm going out of faith. And I'm going to give even though I don't have it. I can tell you this. When you give as unto God, and you give because he first loved you, <coughs> the word of God says you are going to be blessed. Read it again when you get home. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Inspect it carefully. Read all the words that are there. It tells you you're going to be blessed, but it has to start. Because I read to the end of that chapter portion, and it says, out of obedience. So the real question is, in your giving, are you obeying God? And if you're not, you make your commitment right now as you're praying. Say, Lord, I'm going to start obeying you. This is an area that I haven't trusted you. This is an area that I haven't exhibited faith in. This is an area that the enemy has made havoc with my finances. I'm in debt. And Lord, I'm tired of it. I want to get out of it. You can give your way out of debt. Did you know that? You can give your way out of debt. And then God will give you the mindset to start making good decisions. You can go to counselors and get good counseling on how to manage your funds. A part of being a good giver is a being a good steward. And what's a steward? A steward is a manager. And God wants you to be a good manager of the resources that he has for you. God wants to increase your tent. God wants to increase what's in your hand. And the question is, are you willing to surrender to the Lord? So over the next several weeks, we are giving you opportunities to give. So just give liberally. Over the next year, we give you opportunities to give. Give liberally. Give us unto God. And see what God will do. As I saw a little there, you can't beat God giving because He is the master of all giving because God gave his very best and that was his son. So say that prayer right now. Tell God that you repent. Tell God that you want to be a generous giver and ask him to bless you. And as every head is bowed, there might be somebody here that might say, Pastor, I haven't experienced Jesus in my heart. There's been things in my life that have been going radically wrong and I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. The Spirit of the Lord will be moving here quietly. And if you need Jesus this morning, would you just raise your hand? I want to lead you in a prayer. Yes, I see that hand. Is there another hand? I want Jesus to come into my life. Yes, I see another hand. I want to accept the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to radically change my life. And those of you that raise your hand, those of you that want to get in on this prayer, just repeat after me. And if you pray this prayer in faith, you're going to have a radical change in your life. If you pray this prayer in faith, you're going to find that you're going to leave this place and you're not going to do the things that you did anymore. And so what do you need to do? You need to be at church, take one of the Bibles and the people. You won't be stealing. I give you the permission to take one of the Bibles and I want you to read a chapter in the Gospel of John every day. I want you to tell them that you accepted the Lord and when you leave, I want to shake your hand and I want to hold you accountable to be at church, to read your Bible and then I'll introduce you to another brother and sister next week so that you can continue your walk of faith. So just repeat this prayer to me. Dear God, say it whisper to heaven. This is your prayer of faith. This is your prayer of conversion. Say, dear God, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And now, dear Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. Just like Jesus rose from the dead, I rise up to new life in Christ. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I say no to the devil. And I say yes to you in every area of my life. And I am set free. I am healed. <laughs> I am walking in the light of Jesus. Amen and amen. Stand to your feet. Give the Lord a hand.